this video is going to cover a secret history that has been lost to mankind. I think now more than ever we need to be able to imagine this history as a possibility. I say it that way because you do not have to believe the information in this video. Not only am I not claiming it as fact, but I'm warning you right now this subject may be touchy for many people. So I just want to make that clear that this is just a possible reality, not an attempt to force you to believe anything. Do your own research and you may decide for yourself what to believe. We have a specific education that is designed for us, and many of us associate crucial parts of this education with our personality. There's nothing wrong with that, but unfortunately, the rulers that be have a specific agenda at play. This video is not to invoke racism in any way, shape, or form. The purpose is to throw it out, in hopes that it may be useful to all my brothers and sisters, regardless of skin color, that we may see past the boundaries of race or ratios, for we all share the same life that is light. We have been fed lies in order to keep one thing consistent, identity crisis. This was by design, otherwise, why have we not heard more of the true origin of the name of California? It is named after a magnificent black Moorish queen. By more, I mean indigenous enlightened melanated peoples. I don't think our current culture can truly understand how enlightened the indigenous races of these lands were. The prevailing American culture in the youth today revolves around demeaning women, money, and the lust for power. Our ancestors would not only be embarrassed, but disappointed in how lost we have become. Specifically, the indigenous Moors inhabiting what was left of Mu, or what is known in the Spanish legend as the Island of California, were known for their grand psychic abilities. The females ruled as their psychic and mental abilities were far superior than the males. They were master shamans as they could navigate between realms at will, something our modern culture can't even begin to comprehend. The closest topics that we have is dreams, astral projection, but these concepts still don't fully explain to the modern mind the full dynamic of what these ancient lands were like. We can imagine it, but we prescribe that to the realm of fantasy. How do we know this? Well, this tale comes from a Spanish fantasy novel from the 1500s from our modern mainstream timeline, Las Sergas de Esplandian, by Montavo. It is said to be ancient legends, and most people at the time even believed it to be true. Here's what mainstream history says. The Adventures of Esplandian is the fifth book in a series of Spanish chivalric romance novels by Garcia Rodriguez de Montavo, which began with Amadis de Gaula, an even older series. Even Hernán Cortés, who would conquer the Aztec Empire and name the state of California, believed in their legends. I want you to pay attention to this symbol as it will be important later. Bernal Díaz says, Quote, we were seized with admiration and declared they seemed like the castles of enchantment recorded in the book of Amadis de Gala, grand towers, temples, and edifices that seemed to rise from the water, and all these were constructed of stone and mortar. Some of our soldiers said they could not be sure whether they were really seeing this or were dreaming. Now, I have to start this off as if you've never watched a video on this channel. However, there are more videos on the channel that break down the lie of history if you wish to see it explained further. This is more of a sequel to the understanding that our entire history is a lie. Many have heard of the theory of Tartaria by now, but in short, the history we are fed in the education systems are a falsity. A lie designed to keep us enslaved, enslavement through identification crisis. They have taught us to identify ourselves with monkeys, that all human beings originate from Africa, that we evolved through fear and survival, as our consciousness mysteriously forms through some type of physical means. The origin that we are given, of course, is but a random explosion of nothing. They then give us false, soulless history. But many of us know that there's something more. Deep in our subconscious, we know the stories of Atlantis and advanced ancient civilizations. It's a part of our collective memory. We are taught that we had a linear progress of evolution when the truth of the matter is that there have been multiple cataclysms in the past. We know of this too. Everyone knows of the story of the Flood. It is the most known story in the world. That kind of trauma would never go away within our psyches. Yet, that would mean that we de-evolved. That we were once great nations who had achieved peace, and saw past the boundaries of race, ratios. We developed advanced spiritual practices, and had truly reached the Golden Age. Many technologies existed that would be hard for the modern man to imagine possible. In this day, we have lost our sovereignty, 
our minds, our sense of divinity. We have been fed materialism from our birth. The spirit in many of our people are dwindling, but this is the age of awakening. In the official timeline that they give us, the fall of Rome is 2,000 years ago. It's very difficult in a short segment to fully explain everything, especially the timeline, but the way I would put it is that these ancient architectures that we call Greco-Roman are actually from Atlantis, and Atlantis is likely not 13,000 years ago as Graham Hancock suggests. Remember, he believes that we came from monkeys. Atlantis is of a much more recent time, and what was part of what we now know as America. It's hard to comprehend the nature of this reality, and shocking to realize the drastic measures that have taken place in such a short period of time. Many scholars in the modern day have tried to create a new timeline, such as Fomenko and Isaac Newton. The origin of our modern timeline comes from a man named Scaliger. This is where we get our mainstream timeline, but many debate that this is a falsity created by a specific religious group. This group falsified history in order to make it seem as if they have the most ancient religion. The first hint that we see to this is Origen versus Celsus, in which Origen argues for the antiquity of the Jews. It's obvious that at this piece, that Origen is purposely concealing the secret history of the Hyperboreans. Now another piece of the puzzle that you need to understand is the Phoenicians. Very important. In our administered history, they date the Phoenicians to about 5,000 years ago but this group is actually of a much more recent time. Earlier, I mentioned to pay attention to the symbol with Hernan Cortez. You will see these types of symbols everywhere, on the only remaining maps, famous characters that we are fed such as Scaliger. This symbol is the secret symbol for the hidden new rulers, the Headless Knight. The Phoenicians dominated from the Eastern Mediterranean to the coast of Africa, all the way to Spain and Northern Ireland in mainstream history. The confusing part about all of this is that history mixes the group that survived and took over the world, the Catholic Jesuits, with the ancient races that once existed in these lands. These were mixed cultures. The cultures that existed arose from the two ancient god races, the ancient Hyperboreans and the ancient Lemurians. There are obviously more layers to this, so I'll try and explain. The original white people that we have in history are of the Aryan or ancient Hyperboreans, who were fair-skinned with red and blonde hair. Their homeland is in ancient Ibernia in the far north. For black people, the most ancient depiction comes from ancient Irish legends, the Fomorians, a great civilization of great stature who had grand occult abilities. From Donnelly's Atlantis, quote, the Fomorians were from Atlantis. They were called from Horaic, from Morag Afriac, and Formorag which has been rendered into English as Formorians. They possess ships, and the uniform representation is that they came, as the name Formoraig Afraic indicated, from Africa. But in that day, Africa did not mean the continent of Africa as we now understand it. Major Wilford, in the eighth volume of the Asiatic Researches, has pointed out that Africa comes from Apar, Apar, Apara, or Aparica, terms used to signify the West, just as we now speak of the Asiatic world as the East. When, therefore, the Fomorians claimed to come from Africa, they simply meant that they came from the West, in other words, from Atlantis. Now, it is said from these ancient legends that the Fomorians were a warlike race, and that they caused great havoc in the world. These are the times when Atlantis was beginning to fall. War was happening constantly. From Donnelly's Atlantis, quote, the Irish annals speak of the Fomorians as a warlike race, who, according to the annals of Clon MacNoise, were a sept descended from Ham, the son of Noah, and lived in piracy and spoil of the nations, and were in those days very troublesome to the whole world. Were not these the inhabitants of Atlantis who, according to Plato, carried their arms to Egypt and Athens, and whose subsequent destruction had been attributed to divine vengeance invoked by their arrogance and oppressions? Quote, the Fomorians were a civilized race. They had a fleet of 60 ships and a strong army. They were basically ancient sea pirates, and some were giants up to 12 feet tall. They were one of the first explorers of Ireland before the destruction of Atlantis. Quote, they possessed Ireland from so early a period that by some of the historians, they are spoken of as the aborigines of the country. The first invasion to the country was by the Basque people, or the Atlantis settlements in Spain. Many of you may think that this is fantasy, but this is common knowledge in mainstream history. 
How many black people today in America know that Ireland is an integral part of their history? Not many. Quote, the Fomorians defeated Partholon's people, the Basque from Spain, killed Partholon, and drove the invaders out of the country. The next invader to their dominions was Nimhid. He captured one of their fortifications, but it was retaken by the Fomorians under Mort. Nimhid was driven out of the country, and the Atlanteans continued in undisturbed possession of the island, the Fomorians, for 400 years more. Then came the Firbolgs. They conquered the whole island and divided it into five provinces. They held possession of the country for only 37 years when they were overthrown by the Tuatha de Danann, a people more advanced in civilization. The Tuatha de Danann were the Hyperboreans. They came from what we call the North. Now, there's even more history that we don't know. This is from the timeline where most knowledge was destroyed. All we are left with is oral legends. We do have authority on this legend as it is quoted in the Book of Ballymote. So what else do we have? Well, we have legends of ancient Lemuria, the ancestral homeland of black peoples. In H.P. Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine, quote, There is a period of a few million of years to cover between the first mindless race and the highly intelligent and intellectual later Lemurians. Now, before we continue, let me just say that I don't agree with her timeline or completely concur with her views on the Theosophical Society. According to the story, she obtained this information from an ancient book that she had access to that is not exposed to the public. Quote, Madame Blavatsky claimed to have seen a manuscript of the Book of Zion when studying esoteric lore in Tibet. She claimed this and other ancient manuscripts were safeguarded from profane eyes by the initiates of an occult brotherhood. Many of the lands of Lemuria still exist today, such as Australia, New Zealand, Madagascar, and even parts of America such as California. Quote, they, the Lemurians, built huge cities of rare earths and metals. They built out of the fires lava vomited, out of the white stone of the mountains marble, and the black stone of the subterranean fires. They cut their own images and their size and likeness and worshipped them. The Lemurians were a spiritual race of black giants. They were a mix of Mongolian and black and had different organs according to Blavatsky. It is said that they had a physical eye on the back of their head and that this degenerated into the now called third eye and that they were the grand magicians of the elements. Quote, this is the reason why perhaps even Easter Island with its wondrous gigantic statues, a speaking witness to a submerged continent with a civilized mankind on it. This is why many aborigines from the lands around the Pacific Ring of Fire are of a dark complexion. The pure blood of black peoples come from this ancestral homeland of Lemuria. The remnants of this land is in California. The old maps show California as an island because Mu went through many stages and began to merge with the mainland of terra firma as parts of the western coast began to sink. In the occult tradition, root races are basically different versions of the human body in connection with different ages. The first root race was said to be completely ethereal. The second root race had more physical bodies and spawned in Hyperborea. The third root race, the form that we now truly recognize as human, existed on the lost continent of Lemuria. And the fourth root race developed into Atlantis. According to the occult tradition, this isn't all done simply by sexual reproduction. The first root race, the Polarians, from the center pole of our realm, were completely androgynous beings. This esoteric lore is prevalent through the Hellenes as we hear this from Plato. They had the process of asexual reproduction. This changes as it is said that races can manifest into this reality without budding, but through some type of coming down from above or spirit spawning process. As these races developed from spirit and continued their progress through the ages, everything is being recorded into the Akashic records. This affects the next races to come in the coming ages. There were many colonies of Atlantis. We know of one colony today, such as the Almex, was a place where many cultures came and traded. These are the Atlantean races. And I'm not 100% sure how the first two are pronounced, but we have number one, the Romahal, number two, the Tlavati, number three, Toltec, four, First Turanian, five, Original Semite, six, Akkadian, seven, Mongolian. Quote, Thus the first Atlantean races born on the Lemurian continent, 
separated from their earliest tribes into the righteous and the unrighteous, and to those who worship the one unseen spirit of nature, the ray of which man feels within himself, or the pantheist, and those who offered fanatical worship to the spirits of the earth, the dark cosmic, anthropomorphic powers, Saturn, with whom they made alliance. It is important to remember that sometimes, races did overlap and change both in time frames lived or remnants of them survived in the areas occupied. It should also be remembered that in some cases, a catastrophe was anticipated by the priest more in tune with higher energies and many migrations into lands currently in existence took place before all of Atlantis was submerged. There was intermarrying not only among the subraces of Atlantis, but also with the remains of Lemurian subraces who had escaped before the fiery end of Lemuria. The first subrace, quote, The Romahals were a dark race, their complexion being a sort of mahogany black. Their height in these early days was about 10 or 12 feet, truly a race of giants. But through the centuries, their stature gradually dwindled, as did that of all races in turn, and later on we shall find that they had shrunk to the stature of a fur foos man. They ultimately migrated to the southern shores of Atlantis, where they were engaged in constant warfare with the 6th and 7th subraces of the Lemurians then inhabiting that country. A large part of the tribe eventually moved north, while the remainder settled down and intermarried with these black Lemurian aborigines. The second subrace, the Tlavatili, originated on an island off the west coast of Atlantis. They were a strong race, not as tall as the Romaha, with reddish brown skin. They were a mountain-loving people who along with the third subrace, the Toltecs, inhabited the western island which formed part of what is now known as the American continent. The Toltecs, the third subrace, stood about 8 feet tall and had reddish-brown skin, like the Tilavatli, but more coppered colored. The features of the Toltecs, according to William Scott Elliot, were straight and well-marked, not unlike the ancient Greeks. The Toltecs ruled the entire continent of Atlantis peacefully for thousands of years. The Turanians, the fourth subrace, originated on the eastern side of the continent. They were yellow-skinned humans who were never a dominant race on the mother continent, though some of their tribes and family races became fairly powerful. The fifth subrace were the Semites, who had their home on the northeastern part of a peninsula which is now Scotland and Ireland. They were a disconnected race, always warring with their neighbors and maintaining their independence from the southern kings. The sixth subrace, the Akkadians, came into existence after the first great disaster. Born on a peninsula further south of the Semites, the Akkadians quickly migrated to the much larger continent of Atlantis. They fought and overcame the original Semites, ruling Atlantis for several hundred years. The Mongolians, the seventh subrace, had no touch with the mother continent. They were developed from the descendants of the Turanians. They spread over what is now Asia. Master Kut Humi in the Mahatma letters wrote that the modern oriental races such as the Chinese, Mongolian, Tibetan, Malaysian, Indonesian, Japanese, Vietnamese, and so on are largely descended from the seventh and final subrace of the Atlantean root race. Quote, the Lomuro Atlanteans built cities and spread civilization. The incipient stage of anthropomorphism. Their statues witness to the size of the Lomuro Atlanteans. Lemuria destroyed by fire, Atlantis by water, the flood, the destruction of the fourth race and of the last antediluvian monster animals. By monster animals, there were many creatures that used to exist that were truly evil, and we hear stories of this in every culture around the world, or in some type of flood myth, and great mythical creatures that would terrorize the city. After each age, the continents change quite drastically. Continents sink and rise. Comets come and do impossible movements in the sky, unexplainable by modern science, and causes cataclysms and destruction by fire. The myths say that the gods were to blame, as they washed over and judged us as we passed through the ages. We must understand that the continent shifted quite drastically within the last thousand years, as it explains the supposed cartographic errors of the maps from the 16th and 17th century. Notice that most of our maps stop around the 1400s, and this date may even be made up from most of these documents. These new rulers, who were planning to conquer and create a new world, who came from the Phoenician subrace, were masters of the sea, and became the world's first global corporation. They became the hidden hand behind all the global master elite. They conquered Spain as the Castiles, manifesting as the Catholic Jesuits, then becoming the Venetians, 
the hidden hand beneath all public education and science, teaching a new cosmology of Saturn worship. This group worshiped his sun, but we have more than one sun and they shift. In this interpretation, our neighboring planets are suns. This is basic occult knowledge explained in a modern way. But basically, one of these cataclysms that led to the destruction of the great church of Iessa, the destruction of all great Moorish civilizations, and the remaining empires in the world, done through some type of ritual of Baal, in which Saturn could be summoned into this physical world. The Phoenicians worshipped Baal in a way that we could never imagine. A good reference is The Adventures of Captain Mago, a Phoenician expedition a thousand BC, if you want to understand their want for control. Now, this is written from our modern timeline perspective, but what needs to be said is that these elites changed the calendar system and their own age, they added a thousand years. So imagine that the fall of Rome is pushed forward a thousand years on a mainstream timeline. You can trace Freemasonry back to this Phoenician cult. The Phoenicians belonged to the Aryan root race, so originally they were very renowned people. However, they fell to materialism and their quest to dominate the world market. What happened was there was still more powerful empires in the world that posed a threat to the Phoenicians. Many really, the Moors, the Tartarians, the Ottoman Empire, and the Church of Iessa, also known as the Druids, the original Hebrews. They needed to destroy the rest of the Aryans if they wanted to rule the next coming age. Which, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, but they don't all die. It is said that the Atlanteans still exist. Same for the Hyperboreans, for they do not age. So that may just be part of it, is that the Phoenicians got access to this ancient knowledge of esoteric wisdom, and they took advantage of it. They prepared devices for surviving underwater, hence the symbolism of the mermaid prevalent in their culture and the worship of the conch. Either way, they survived this event and immediately began educating and creating the new world. Historical figures were made up completely. All the knowledge that we have is from the main school in Venice, from the Phoenicians who became the Venetians. These Jesuits then conquered through Spain and Britain. This version of Spanish is the Jesuit Spanish tongue, Castilian Spanish. The Royal Castile family is a branch of the Phoenician chain, as you can see with the royal arms. Just look at the royal arms of all these families and you will clearly see who's in charge. They took old kings and renamed them and gave them new dates. The Library of Alexandria, containing the knowledge of all ages before, was burned. This group sought out the remaining knowledge in the world through the Knights Templar burning the sacred esoteric knowledge of all the nations. In Plato's Timaeus, Solon, a Hellene, goes to one of the colonies in Egypt known as Saïs. Based on his description, Plato presents the priest to be a darker complexion. These people are not exactly the pure bloods from Lemuria, but a mixed race with multiple shades from dark brown to light brown with slight variations of hue, mostly red, said to be descended from the Ptolemaics. There may have been some who had the strong blood from the Lemurian race with a dark black with bluish reflection, but they are not from these lands. We will soon see that there are many different races of people who lived in these lands. From Plato's Timaeus, quote, Thereupon one of the priests, who was of very great age, said, Oh Solon, Solon, you Hellenes are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you. Solon in return asked him what he meant. I mean to say, he replied, that in mine, you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age, and I will tell you why. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story, which even you preserve, that one upon a time, Hathion, the son of Helios, have yoked the steeds in his father's chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and him, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth, and a great configuration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At such times, those who live upon the mountains and in the dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. Now for some context here, basically Solon took a trip to Saïs and Egypt, and when Solon arrived, they greeted him with great honor. It seems that he wanted to share his knowledge, Solon, as if he was slightly boasting about his esoteric wisdom that he had recently learned. The priest is responding and telling him about a race of people who not only he didn't know about, but were a common ancestor of the two. Also, in terms of timeline and Plato, this could be ancient information or different books from the authors from the last age, compiled into one author, created by, you guessed it, the new rulers, Jesuit Phoenicians. 
I still think many of these books contain golden nuggets that they have left for those who seek wisdom. The only thing is remember, they are trying to date this as if this process took 8,000 years. They adjusted the age in the translation based on the new knowledge at the time that this was translated. This is also where Blavatsky bases a lot of her history, including Tibetan and Hindu philosophies. So you can see how these made up figures of the church could have influenced both science and occult circles. We continue, quote, As for those genealogies of yours which you just now recounted to us, Solon, they are no better than tales of children. In the first place, you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noble race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. And this was unknown to you because, for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving no written word. For there was a time so long before the great deluge of all, when the city, which now is Athens, was first and war in every way the best governed of all cities. It is said to have performed the noblest deeds and to have had the fairest constitution of any which tradition tells under the face of heaven. Solon marveled at his words, and earnestly requested the priest to inform him exactly in order about these former citizens. You're welcome to hear about them, Solon, said the priest, both for your own sake and for that of your own city, and above all, for the sake of the goddess who is the common patron and parent and educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours, receiving from the earth and Hephaestus the seed of your race, and afterwards she founded ours, of which the constitution is recorded in our sacred registers to be eight thousand years old. Now, in Donnelly's Atlantis, quote, What proof do we have that the Egyptians were a colony from Atlantis? 1. They claim descent from the twelve great gods, which must have meant the twelve gods of Atlantis, to wit, Poseidon and Cleito and their ten sons. 2. According to the traditions of the Phoenicians, the Egyptians derived their civilization from them, and as the Egyptians far antedated the rise of the Phoenician nations proper, this must have meant that the Egypt derived its civilization from the same country to which the Phoenicians owed their own origin. The Phoenician legends show that Mysore, from whom the Egyptians were descended, was the child of the Phoenician gods Amnius and Magus. Mysore gave birth to Tuat, the god of letters, the inventor of the alphabet and Tuat became Thoth, the god of history of the Egyptians. San Janiathan tells us that the Kronos, king of Atlantis, visited the south and gave all of Egypt to the god Tuat, that it might be his kingdom. Mysore is probably the king Mester named by Plato. It was common knowledge throughout the 19th century that the Phoenicians were the predecessors to the Egyptians. This has now since changed in academic circles as they tend to try to hide this Phoenician group as much as possible. The reason being is because the Phoenicians is a cover name for a group of people who descended from the great Hyperboreans and established a priesthood in many of these lands after the flood. We know this in history as the Celtic race. However, the connection between the Celtics and Phoenicians is not discussed in modern academic circles. Therein lies the problem. The Phoenicians, or Phoenicians, were once a great race. This is the mother priesthood called the Church of Iessa that the priest Antimaeus is discussing. They came and instructed many of the races after the flood, re-establishing the common traits of civilization. The myths of white red-haired giant mummies are common from around the world. These people were hunted by this new group of rulers as well, for they wanted to destroy the pure bloodline of all races so that they could be the only race of God, creating a new bloodline. This group took over the original priesthood of Iessa, labeled them pagans, stole their history, and enslaved humanity in all other races. They took over the Bible and began teaching that God can only be reached through the Church of Jesus, when that the old teachings were never about belief and authority, but in a beautiful mythos that connected divinity and man as one, as a moral respect for nature, a duty for taking care of all life and spreading peace through a divine cosmology of self, one that had been passed down for generations through studying the stars carefully and aligning them to attributes of ego and self. This is how astrology, or astrotheology, was passed back into the world after the flood of Atlantis. These Jesuits, and the Church of Rome, who really belonged to the Akkadian subrace, not the original Semites, or in other words, Celts, these Akkadians caused war and destruction among the rest of the Aryan nations, specifically starting with the original Semites, and this is where the Phoenicians come in. They then merged all of this history into one history under the discreet and secret name Phoenicians, which really refers to multiple peoples, and they did this through taking over Rome and then the rest of the world. Quote, the Great Pyramid in its original and dazzling splendor of light under the Egyptian sun was the object in wonderment and awe to all beholders. It surpassed in sublime grandeur any other monument or structure ever erected by man on this globe. It was considered the greatest of the seven wonders in the ancient world. Its partial destruction and defacement by removing its upper part and capstone and by stripping it of the outer casing of white stone, which gave it an aspect of dazzling brightness, leaving it in outward appearance bare and nude, 
silent and mute as to its mission, as a milestone without a figure. This has been a great loss to mankind. In its former glory, it was a mountain of light, a blaze of brightness, a symbol in the desert. It was a testimonial and living stone, bespeaking to mankind of their inheritance of a spiritual kingdom. At noonday, its lofty golden capstone seemed to be at one with the sun, uniting earth and heaven in eternal unity, a symbolic union of spirit and matter. Tomorrow, this sublime pillar, this grand masterpiece of the Irish Magian priest of Iessa, was a part of a plot as selfish as any ever conceived. Now another example is Baalbek. That temple was not originally created for Baal, but it is known as that because the Phoenicians took over this land and dedicated ancient Aryan temples to Saturn worship. The original Semites are also known as the Druids or the Irish Magian priests. Now in history, they are known to be the original Druids, the descendants of the Hyperboreans. They re-established high culture after the flood and were known as fair-skinned with red and blonde hair. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't any black people who belonged to this church. There very may well have, as we know now the true history of Ireland, as Fermorians were the original aborigines before taken over by the Duwahadadanen. Interracial relationship had already begun, as we can see in the story of Timaeus with the Egyptian priest, and many other myths from around the world such as the Aztecs and China. We even have stories of the Queen of Scotia. Quote, the story of Scotia begins with a Greek king by the name of Gaethalos. In one version of the story, which involves Ireland, Gaethalos is known as Godha Glas. The word Gael is said to be derived from his name, and was originally from the region of Scythia. It is also said that Godha Glas lived during the time of Moses, and the latter is said to have cured the former when he was bitten by a serpent. Goad Hall Glass was also promised by Moses that no serpent or other poisonous creature would inhabit the western island that his posterity would inhabit it one day. One of Goad Hall Glass' grandsons, Niul, was invited into Egypt as an instructor by a pharaoh, and eventually married one of his daughters, Scotia. Both Scotland and the Roman name for Ireland, Scotia, are said to be derived from her name. Niul and Scotia's people were later derived from Egypt by a later pharaoh and wandered around the Mediterranean until they reached Spain. Scotia was said to be a white queen with blue eyes from her native land of Scotland. So it's fair to say that Egypt was a quite diverse culture, not to mention that the hieroglyphs have people of many different sizes, but it begins to make us question whether black people came from Africa. In many references, it suggests that the Ptolemics lived in this area first after Atlantis. The Egyptian culture developed into a multicultural center for learning and spiritual development for all races. Plato even came to Egypt supposedly to go through a ritual in the Grand Pyramid. It seems that Egyptologists are happy to distort the history of these lands and slap on dates however they like. They also are hiding evidence from being explored as many sites are still hidden to the public. The story of Egypt and its timeline is distorted because it is the last remaining power edifice from the last age. Not only did the Phoenicians take control of the spiritual center of the world, they destroyed all conflicted evidence of this root race and all her sub-races. This could be why the leaders still to this day show off these Egyptian artifacts around the world to show who the new true rulers are. Quote, it was conceived and put into effect by the ruling spirits at the head of the Roman church and state of their day, who cherished the ambitious and far-reaching idea of nothing less than universal rule for their church and empire. In the course of these pages, I will endeavor to explain and expose the conspiracy and the means by which those designing men who composed it advanced their project. And with the aid of their successors, they, I purpose to show, by persistent effort, brought the greater part of the Western world under their empire and church dominion, and brought this conspiracy to an almost complete success. It was the idea held by the leaders of the Roman church and state, they were practically one, that all power should be centralized in the head of the church, who was emperor of the state. And any and all religious institutions which in any way conflicted with this ideal were to be done away with. For this reason, the mystery cults were suppressed, and initiation into the ancient or esoteric mysteries were forbidden, so that no religious establishment, worship, or practice would exist which would draw and hold men to it other than the Roman state church. And besides, as the study and preparation necessary for those who were selected for initiation into the higher mysteries was such as to develop a highly philosophic and spiritual state of mind. Such study and preparation did not comport with the object which the church rulers had in view. Such minds would not yield adherence to a mere political and idolatrous church, which doctrines were, in the main, intended for the uninstructed multitude. Such minds could not be dominated by a political or mercenary priesthood. They were enlightened men, and they stood in the way of the church project. Therefore, the institutions which produced such men were to be suppressed. Connor McDarry. So now we fast forward to the lie of the Civil War. The plan was to create a new Atlantis, but there were still great civilizations living in the Americas. At this point in time now, 
The Venetians had conquered California through the Spanish and the northeast of America through the English, but large portions of the Midwest, especially in the Grand Canyon, were still occupied by a great race. Giants were still in America up to just 200, even 100 years ago, and still wouldn't be surprised if some are still remaining. We hear of these stories with like Lovelock Cave and the cannibalistic giants, but there's two theories here. One, that this is a cover-up to hide the great races that were living in America at the time. Or two, after the cataclysm of the sun, barbarism began along with tribalism. The great nations began to fall apart, and this is what led to the Venetians taking over large sections. But let's continue to the Civil War. And all around the point of 1812 is where this event took place that let the Venetians finally take over America, or terra firma. In the history of almost every American city, something huge happens around this date. The movement of power, a treaty, a war, something, a fire, an earthquake. There was a huge event where the sun again disappeared and there was no summer for a few years. Now, throughout the ages, many cultures have made slaves of other races and or nations. It's happened since Lemuria. It did happen in America at one time during the fall of Atlantis, but the Aryan sub-races did not enslave men, for they were noble men. The idea that slaves were brought over to America from Africa starts to become questionable. It wasn't until the 1812 period that the plan to rewrite history of America began for the Jesuit empires of Spain, Britain, and France in order to conquer the last remaining civilizations living in terra firma. They have you believe that black peoples, by the millions, were shipped from Africa to America, yet, if that were so, we would see well-preserved slave ships, but few are to be found and their genuineness are to be questioned after learning about this secret history. This name, African American, was offered many times and always rejected by the natives to these lands. Because there's such a confusion about the people, and that was done deliberately, by, by, by bringing over a few hundred thousand dark people from the Caribbean islands and from possibly from the continent mm -hmm. by way of the Caribbean islands, bringing them here to these lands, mm -hmm. creating this facade of everybody coming from the motherland yeah. Yeah. instead of being from here. So, so, so there it's created a massive ball of confusion and this, mm -hmm. this is not what they wanted to do. They wanted to be able to solidify this, that the Negro and the black man, you're from Africa, accepted a long time ago, but it wasn't accepted. Okay. As much as they tried to create it into acceptance through the Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. So it's about identity. It's strictly about identity. Everything that we experience, black folk, lack of a term, white folk in this country. Many natives of both North and South America were home to many indigenous black peoples, such as in New York, in Mexico, Wisconsin, in San Francisco, Southern California, they were in Mississippi, and in Oklahoma. This is a depiction of a black native from Terra Fire, or like we have mentioned earlier, Terra Firma throughout South America. The Caribbean islands were home to the native black peoples. Black people have been on this land far before Christopher Columbus ever stepped foot, if he even existed. We have maps and depictions of Africa, with many towns and cities that seem to be castles, I also have shown you sources in the last chapter that most Egyptians were not of pure black Lemurian origin. So why are we fed this lie of Africa? It is to attach the identity of the native peoples of ancient Amorica with a faraway land so that they may be enslaved mentally. This whole process was about erasing the last age, and these cultures were high civilizations that preserved the knowledge of the ages before. Therefore, the rulers that be forced the Spanish English, and French nations to conquer these lands at all cost. They were funded by the same hidden hand, the first new global corporation, also known in history as the East Indian Trading Company, the first global national corporation. Now remember, the Phoenicians, or as we now know the Akkadians, added a thousand years to the calendar. So, these two histories are interlinked and we can think of this time as the new takeover of the old Aryan world. To get ready for the next coming root race, they needed to wipe out our sense of identity, our connection with our ancestors. There's a really interesting post on stolen history that talks about how slave houses in the south were actually owned by the Cherokee, the people who got expelled from Rome after it was conquered by the Phoenicians. Quote, 
Cherokee, who were living in Western-style houses, the Cherokee were living inside of antebellum mansions before settlers turned them into plantations. The antebellum mansions look like Roman palatial estates and are covered in pagan symbols and have pagan murals inside of them. Truth is, they've been hiding the real history of North America for centuries, and only the wisest see through the lies. Quote, All roads lead to Rome, Georgia. It is called Rome because that is what the Cherokee called their land. To their dying breath, they claimed to be from Rome and were Romans. They were expelled from their land and lost their property in the 1830s. This is what we're told in the schools, that the North attacked the South and over 600,000 people died over fighting for slavery. If we were to look further, we may find that some things don't add up completely. For one, the Star Forts. They want you to believe that around 150 forts were created basically in the 19th century. And trust me, I've been to one of these. These things look old. We have a video on Star Forts, but basically, the idea is that they put cannons on these bastion forts as a naval strategy for enemy ships. This idea that cannons can shoot ships from miles away from iron balls skipping on the water has yet to be proven and seems like a complete cover up. Also, in our Star Fort video, we show evidence of pumps and underground buried sections. And even when you read the official narrative, there's always something that happened that ended in complete destruction of these forts. I'm sure that these forts were used by the British, Spanish, and French, but they did not build them. These arches are quite advanced and we can find similar star forts from around the world. There were great nations already existing in America, such as the ones described in the Book of Mormon and what we know today as Tartaria and Moorish cultures. They want you to think that an empire or corporation was built off of slavery and the South was just not willing to give that up. The last remaining peoples in these lands belong to the Aryan Epoch. The Jesuits, through Britain, Spain, and Rome, began enslaving all of these remaining races in America during the 1800s. They made up the lie of the Civil War in order to make you believe that they fought for black people's freedoms, when really, this is a falsity constructed to enslave all the remaining races. The original Semites, almost all of them that remained in America, were completely wiped out. Remember, these were the original Druids or Celts that were sent out of Rome after its destruction. The black people who were left in America posed a problem to these invading Jesuit nations because there were still many left as this was their homeland and as we know from the secret history and the legend of Calafia. The original Semites who traveled to America, or the Celts in America, were foreign travelers who were trying to escape this Akkadian Jesuit takeover. So where do we get this history of black slavery? Well. During the 1800 to 1812 period, the plan to create this illusion that black people came from Africa began. John Lynch, who was known for colonizing cities in America and naming it after himself, such as Lynchburg, Virginia, supposedly, he immigrated from Ireland to Virginia and then somehow prospered. Now, John Lynch sent a letter stating a plan for civilizing these new Africans on the coast of Africa, and his plan was to populate it with blacks from America. Quote, that the benevolent society now established in England for the purpose of civilizing the Africans was set on foot by Granville Sharp, one of its active members, and he was stimulated there too by a letter wrote by William Dillwyn a considerable time back requesting him to suggest a plan of such a society forming a colony for the purpose eventually of promoting the civilization of the Africans and receive subjects for such a colony from this country. Lynch's letter was inspired, sponsored, and altered from a woman named Anne Mifflin, a Quaker from Philadelphia. She was a part of one of these English groups colonizing in America as one of the many denominations of the Christian faith. They had struck treaties, or in other words, paid off or forced the indigenous leaders to give up their lands. The history books don't teach about these remaining empires in America during the 18th century. This plan was really a plan to wipe out the remaining threat of Aborigines and to create a false identity by shipping many blacks to Africa to create this society off the coast of Africa. They wanted to civilize these blacks or brainwash them into thinking like the Akkadian or mainstream history Phoenician brain. They transformed all the races into this reptilian survival and taught the worship of an exterior god. We became focused around property and materialism and we lost our spiritual ways. All of the sub-races of this epoch, not just black peoples, 
We are still in the Aryan Epoch, and these Phoenician Akkadian leaders are still in control and have fed us the lie of history as we know it. Academia. Anne Mifflin met in Lynchburg and made a plan with other invaders on plans to remove and suppress the black peoples of those colonies. They seemed to be having problems and they needed to stop it immediately for good this time. September 1810. Anne spoke with James Wood on shipping recently freed slaves from the South, or the new generation that had been trained to believe in a false history, were to relocate to an island named Bolama on the coast of West Africa. This plan was the beginning of the African-American enslavement training. James Wood endorsed the plan. The many abolitionists who developed during this period were said to be against slavery, but this is just a setup. These people are the ones that enslaved them in the first place. It's like philanthropy. They wanted to make themselves seem like the redeemers, when all they did was completely brainwash and replace the sense of self with a foreign entity. The enslavement did happen, but it was simply a brainwashing process on the homeland. One of these abolitionists was Granville Sharp. He gave the illusion that he wanted to end the slave trade when he had part in creating it. Also, key to note that it is very possible that black people were moved around such as from the Caribbean islands and maybe even a few from Africa, but the story that by the millions they came from Africa is extremely questionable. He took part with Anne Mifflin in creating the Sierra Leone Company, which is now the modern day name for this area of Bolama. The aborigines of these Lemurian Atlantean lands, now known today as America, were made slaves when the invading colonials arrived. These colonials themselves were brainwashed by the ruling church at that time. At this time, many of the people may have disagreed with what was going on, but through the funding of the church manifesting as Spain, Britain, and France, these colonials devised a plan of entering terra firma and conquering the rest of the Americas. Spain knew of these lands before Columbus. That was the point of bringing up Calafia at the beginning. The Amethyst of Gaul legends go back to the 15th century or even earlier, supposedly. Thomas Jefferson did reply to this plan by Anne Mifflin and said that this would be the most desirable measure in which could be adopted for gradually drawing off the black population. He endorsed it and thought that it should be the highest priority for the United States to make an establishment off the coast of Africa. This plan was well received by the rest of these forming new colonies in America and the plan began to remove and indoctrinate the remaining population of the aborigines of this land. These abolitionists from the north did not care about black people at all, and that's another reason to consider why the Civil War is simply a farce. Common for his times, Jefferson believed blacks were inherently inferior to whites and thought it was best the two races remained segregated. Now remember, all these groups, the Spanish, the English, and the French, all spawned from this original Phoenician, Akkadian, Canaanites, worshippers of Baal, and yes, they were extremely racist towards all colored races. However, that wasn't always the case, for these are not the true representation of white peoples. The Akkadians took over what was left of the original Semites, or original Druids, and these people did not judge on the basis of skin, as we hear in the story of Timaeus with the priests, as we hear in the legends of Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan, which has a similarity to the Irish deity Cahollan. I say that because it is time that we drop this idea that the colors are superior to another, or even the idea that we should forever remember that we were once victims. In the Atlantis Epoch, the Fomorians dominated over many lands and enslaved many different races, including whites. It has happened between different races of similar colors. This is simply the evil of mankind. But there was a golden age of Atlantis, where different races found peace, and the only pursuit was of the mind and spiritual intellect. It was the passion of almost all her people, red, yellow, black, and white. So the only way to find a solution is to see the problem clearly. Identity crisis. Even beyond the colors of our skin, many of us were given false histories, and our homelands were forgotten. But on a greater scale, our spiritual identities were lost. A new age began where we forgot about our own structures and architecture and the very cities that we now currently all share in America. The colonials did not build these cities. The groundwork for all major cities was built upon an existing civilization. That is the secret that has been kept from our education in order to enslave mankind under an exterior god. 
the god of materialism and death, Saturn. Thank you for watching. We send this video out with love and passion. If you feel that you disagree, simply don't watch it or help educate us. These times are truly confusing. We wish you all the best on your journey, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?